Hello, everyone. This is Sierra Hatfield, Policy Analyst at the Council of State Governments Headquarters here in Lexington, Kentucky. I staff the Smart Government Subcommittee of CSG's Future of Work National Task Force. The Smart Government Subcommittee is researching how state governments can implement new technologies for better service delivery without losing the human element that defines public work. Today, I have three speakers, Jenny LeFleury from Microsoft, Karen Tamley from Access Living, and James Thurston from G3 ICT, who over the course of the hour will talk to us about how that technology can be used to increase access to government services. Obviously, this conversation has a place in times of a public health crisis such as this, but our speakers are also seeking to look beyond the boundaries of today and ask what can state governments do to support the technologies and the culture of inclusion needed to create a future that is accessible to all. Our first speaker today is Jenny LeFleury, Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft. Jenny, whenever you're ready. Hi there, folks, and thank you for having me in such esteemed company uh, to talk about a topic that I'm blissfully passionate about, and I know many are. Um, I'll start by giving a little bit of context. Uh, Microsoft is one company focused on this space, one of many, and one of many with a lot of history uh, to what we've been doing, particularly in the area of accessibility and how we embed that into our products and our services and everything that we do. The history is always good to wallow in for a second. Uh, accessibility started 20 -ish years ago at Microsoft back in the 90s. And back then it was really seen as a dual strand discipline. Um, I, forgive me, I'm seeing audio issues coming through. Is that do I pause? I haven't been getting any issues. It sounds choppy on my end this, as well. Um, this I'm is Will. Sure. Yes, I hear something too. <clears throat> um, Sierra, do you, does your video need to be on? No. Let's close video for everyone who doesn't need the video on and see if that helps us out. So sad. I'm not um, and then I think, is it my audio? Um, there is a little bit of an echo coming, so let's all uh, be mindful. If you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Go ahead and give me a little bit of test audio now, and let's see if that improves the situation. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Much better. Okay. All right, sorry about that. Please carry on. Um, I'll start again. It's probably easiest, right? For you for editing? Yes, would you like me to uh, read your introduction one more time? No, no, I got it. Okay. So thank you for having me and thank you for having me, particularly in, in amongst um, some folks that I hold in just incredibly high regard. Um, I'm excited to talk about this. This is a really important topic. And I think the uh, history of this topic is a great place to start. Um, accessibility and the inclusion of people with disabilities is never been more important than it is right now. Um, lots and lots of reasons for that. But when you peel the onion back, particularly at Microsoft as one company providing technology and inclusive accessible technology, one of many out there, it started back in the 90s. And there were really two strands to that conversation back then. One was within a company uh, that was growing. We had a growing employee uh, base of people with disabilities coalescing and discussing best practices amongst themselves. And th at the same time, we also had accessibility as a first time, first discipline. Uh, in fact, Bill Gates really put that in uh, back in the 90s. They were two separate strands and the power of those separate strands didn't really come together, although they both continued to evolve and have their journey of 
beauty and not over the years. Um, but really five years ago, we took an opportunity to bring them together. I came in as in my current role. In fact, I joined 15 years ago at Microsoft and my journey in was bringing those two together. It wasn't planned, but I joined as a, an individual who is profoundly but deceptively deaf. I joined the deaf group. Uh, I then joined every other group because I'm rather nosy and found that they were all talking about the power uh, of conversation around disability, how to talk to their managers, how to self-identify accommodations, benefits and technology. And so really connecting up these two was a very natural next step for Microsoft. Because if you have people with disabilities embedded into the fabric of your company, using products, really pulling that expertise every single day, that is your font of wisdom that will make your products simply better no matter what they are. Those voices need to be heard, they need to be listened to, and they need to be embedded into the process. And that's really a core pillar for what we try to do at Microsoft. We actually consider accessibility as a key part of running a business. Um, and over the years, we've been able to solidify that into what we call an evolution model by which we manage dimensions of the business and the prevalence and the maturity of disability and accessibility as part of them whether it's including people with disabilities into the core and fabric of our hiring processes and retention, or it's in our supply base where we have 30,000 suppliers and making sure that the, what we receive from our suppliers is inclusive and accessible, as well as our design processes and product processes, which for folks looking at Microsoft, clearly they, it's, it's such the core of what we do, whether it's Windows, Xbox, Office, or Microsoft Paint, making sure that accessibility is just a key part of how we are building that. And that means that we follow the principles of inclusive design. And inclusive design is really about making sure that as you are looking at your next iteration of whatever it is in front of you, that you are including people with disabilities into that process. You are gathering those perspectives you are making sure that you are leaning into the lived experience of people as you design and build. And then the output is holistically more inclusive as a result. And we've been able to really prove that as part of our own processes uh, and what we do within our engineering roadmaps and the outputs coming out. All this suffice to say is that we've been on a journey and we continue that journey and some of the output is really what I hope to be powering people with disabilities and others um, with technology that whether you're in work, life, play, stay at home, educate at home, uh, your educators of your children at this time, this technology that can power and assist you. And I'd say in these times we've really learned uh, a lot. I do think that accessibility in what has been out there, and I take one product, which is Microsoft Teams, which is our core communications product. Thankfully, a lot of this work had already been in place by the time we hit COVID. COVID was an enormous shift for us all. Um, but in many ways, some of what we had been able to do over the last several years came to the fore. COVID forces us to work from home, live at home, and to do a lot of things um, that we didn't think were necessarily part of how we would work and live and breathe. For me, as somebody who leverages ASL um, and is profoundly deaf, I am uh, not used to working with my sign language interpreter, who's on the call with me right now, in a remote environment. We actually had to flick that pretty much overnight here in Seattle uh, when the news came down. And we went through a learning process, that learning process of just how do we communicate with one another in this environment? How do we use the technology to power us in that? How do we make sure that captioning is prevalent on everything that we do? Um, and flick from a physical environment to a virtual environment. We've successfully achieved that and figured out a lot of those strategies. And we were one of thousands of people who did that. 
I look at key indicators, things like our disability answer desk, which is a dedicated environment for customers with disabilities. That had a 200% increase in volume. In fact, it's over that right now from folks reaching out to us to find out what technologies were available, how could I use them, what were the best practices, um, and hey, I'm using this product and I've got some ideas. Uh, I've seen a bug here. I've seen something that doesn't work the way I want it, and I want you to know about it. That feedback has been utterly, utterly invaluable. It's driven us to make improvements um, in some of those products. Microsoft Teams now has captioning embedded into everything. There are new features like hand raise. If you press a button and your hand goes up so you can get your point across while not waiting for somebody to take a pause in what they're saying. It's visible to individuals whether you are sighted or not. Um, making sure that uh, we've included our automated captioning while no replacement for for cart but it's just included in all of our communication products including the free version of teams uh, which we just announced in the last week and as those volumes have increased and teams volumes have gone utterly off the radar as we move to this world making sure that our principles of inclusion and accessibility and inclusive design have remained residual and that feedback is heard and embedded back into the products. We have really netted out um, from this period on a set of core principles that carry us forward and as I think about accessibility in government and in public sector and with everything that you all are doing right now which has never been more important I think these principles uh, are residual lean into your uh, people with disabilities lean into their expertise and listen to the voice it really is the gold dust that will power you going forward making sure that you have clear employment programs that are inclusive and accessible and you bring in that voice and remember that disability is 70 percent plus invisible you may not know or see and it's not your job to identify that, but it is your job to create a safe environment where someone can bring themselves into the workplace. Making sure that your supply chain includes accessibility and you don't just have it as part of your documentation, you check it. Um, and you have that bar of understanding that's clearly out there. And we eliminate, we've actually, Microsoft's taken a step further and eliminated things like 14C certificates because we do not believe that any individual should be paid less than minimum wage. And then when it looks at your products, I think we need to bear in mind that there is a learning curve for everyone as we've moved to this environment, but the inclusive accessible features within them are imperative. Make sure that the, the details like disability answer desk, support environments, FAQs, um, and simple um, details of how to leverage these environments are out there, they're known, they're understood, and that anything that you send is accessible. Within Microsoft Office, that means that you click on a little button right next to spell check called Accessibility Checker. It will check your document, your email, your PowerPoint, your Excel, whatever it may be, to ensure that it is inclusive and accessible. If you don't have a disability and you're not in an accessibility role, you still have a responsibility to be inclusive in what you do and what you send. And amplify the voices and the expertise. I would encourage everyone to go check out microsoft.com slash accessibility and particularly a blog series of our employees sharing their best practices and their learning through this period. I know there's a lot of others out there and I sit and consume a lot of it, but really do lean in to that expertise and get it out there so others can learn and accelerate their journey. There's a lot more that I'm sh I, I could share, but let me let me pause, let me stop and let me pass the mic back um, because I, I'm excited to listen to uh, Karen and James uh, and what they have to say as well. Thank you so much, Jenny, uh, for being here and for a wonderful presentation of everything Microsoft has been doing. 
Um, so in the interest of time, we're going to keep moving on to our second speaker and hold the questions we received in advance from subcommittee members until the end. So our next speaker is James Thurston, uh, G3 ICT's Vice President for Global Strategy and Development. James? Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sierra, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this conversation with, with two people who I love spending time with, who I admire, uh, Jenny and Karen. Really two people who I, I learn something from every time I, I interact with them. So it, it's great to be a part of this conversation with you and with them. Maybe by a brief way of, of introduction, G3ICT stands for the Global Initiative for Inclusive ICTs. I like to say we're a, a small international nonprofit with a big global footprint and global impact. Uh, and we were created about 14 years ago specifically to work with governments, with civil society, with companies on issues of digital transformation and digital inclusion. Uh, we were created at about the time that a, a new global UN human rights treaty, treaty was coming into force. And I think that governments around the world realize that as we are becoming more and more interactive and using technology, that the opportunity and the impact for people with disabilities could be enormous. Uh, and so we were created to help governments primarily, but also civil society and others focus on how do we promote technology policies, technology programs that really support the digital inclusion of, of people with disabilities worldwide. And we've been doing that in a variety of ways for 14 years or so, so now. And one of the things that I think we see, and one of the reasons we get so actively involved in this issue of digital transformation is that we really are undergoing a global digital transformation. And we see it in every sector, we see it in developing economies and developed economies. Uh, and we believe pretty strongly that digital transformation or, or using and deploying technology assets um, can really go hand in hand and has to go hand in hand with digital inclusion. The risk is that if we're not thinking about accessibility and inclusion as part of becoming smarter, as part of, uh, in terms of smart cities and smart governments, uh, if we're not thinking about it, uh, then we risk really creating a, an even greater digital divide for people with disabilities. So we, we, we see this digital transformation every day, I, I think, Sierra, you may have referenced that in Jenny as well, that we're, we're doing this recording in the middle of, uh, of a global pandemic. We're already hearing from the, the governments at all levels that we work with around the world that they expect that they will be using technology even more as we come out of this pandemic. Um, it is interesting, I was speaking with a university, a large state university here in the US the other day with their CIO. He mentioned that their use of collaboration software um, and uh, re remote video teleconferencing uh, for one sub subscription they had went from, from 2,000 uses a month to four to 7,000 uses a day during this pandemic. And that they expect that, that to sort of uh, continue even after uh, things settle down after the pandemic, that, that that reliance and that use of technology will continue to increase. And we're seeing that really everywhere, which is, uh, the, the technology the technologist in me loves that. It's exciting. Um, but we also know that it presents some real risks for people with disabilities if we're not thinking about accessibility and inclusion as part of that. And this digital transformation is particularly important, I think, in, in the public sector with government services. Cities and states and, and uh, national level governments are all deploying technology um, to support their, their broad range of really critical services that they provide in transportation services, health services, education services, public safety, uh, courts and justice systems, uh, in housing, unemployment and social services. All of these are, are leveraging technology to support delivering critical services to people in cities and states and in countries. Uh, again, which is great, but we really need to be thinking about accessibility as, as part of that. Um, because it has an enormous impact on the day-to-day -day lives of people with disabilities in communities in, in, in countries and states and cities. So for example, we know that uh, if, if you're implementing a digital payment system, mobile apps, uh, that you can design that system to be accessible, that you can make sure that it doesn't time out so quickly that a person with a cognitive disability isn't able to actually use that, that, that digital payment system. 
or kiosks, which are uh, increasingly important for, for ticketing and, and financial services, making sure that those are designed to be accessible as well for someone with mobility uh, impairments so that the, the screen and the, the keyboard are placed in a way that they can be accessed and even the kiosk itself can be accessed by someone in a wheelchair. Um, during this pandemic, I know one of the things that I check in, every day is, is our city's digital dashboard on the pandemic. Increasingly, cities and states uh, are have open data policies. They're, they're pushing data out that, that really impacts the day-to-day -day life of people with disabilities. Uh, I, I live in Washington, D.C. I check our COVID dashboard every morning to see what is the, the, the current rate of hospitalization rate, uh, how quickly our case is doubling, uh, all those data, data points which are updated every day, that website is not accessible. Uh, I, I used a free checker and, and I think there were 142 points where the website failed. And so uh, that kind of critical information, particularly during a pandemic, is, is, um, needs to be accessible. And it can be. The good news is that it absolutely can be accessible. Uh, another organization called ITIF, the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, recently did a study of state unemployment websites and found that 40% of state unemployment websites failed basic accessibility tests. Uh, and if you think about the fact that, that unemployment rates currently have, have, have really skyrocketed, that uh, even in the best of times, unemployment rates for people with disabilities are disproportionately high relative to the population as a whole, access to, to unemployment websites is really critical um, and they can be accessible. So we're doing work uh, with, with governments at all levels, civil society and, and companies to think about how we can make sure that this exciting digital transformation is happening in a way uh, that, that is accessible, where these technologies and these smart solutions can be used by people with disabilities, particularly if they're in support of, of critical services being offered by the public sector. And we know that, that uh, as Jenny was saying, technology can be designed to be usable by anyone, including smart solutions. Um, there are very robust global accessibility standards that, that smart and leading companies use to, to design their solutions, to design their technologies. Um, and, and we really want to evangelize those, get those out, make sure that governments are also really aware of those, including at the, at the state level, because uh, they really define what it means, these standards, what it means to be accessible for all kinds of technologies and, and really all kinds of disabilities. So moving forward, uh, as we're thinking about uh, and continuing our work at G3ICT and thinking about what we're hearing from our partners around the world will be an accelerated digital transformation of, of society, including of the public sector. What can we be doing to make sure that digital inclusion really does go hand in hand with digital transformation? And we, we certainly make available through G3ICT uh, all kinds of tools and resources. We have model policies for accessible telecommunications, for accessible kiosks, uh, for inclusive education, and we make those available on our website. We've got a, a set of tools for smart cities in particular. I think those tools are also quite relevant to, to smart governments. Um, those tools are available in 10 languages. Uh, and uh, I think um, in a very exciting way, we've started to define what it means to be an inclusive smart city, an inclusive smart university, an inclusive smart government. And we've got a a couple maturity model assessment tools that really look at what it means for, for an entity to be both smart using technology, using data, and also inclusive at the same time. And I wanted to share with you just a little bit about kind of uh, our framework for what we think defines a smart government, including a smart state government. So it's uh, the framework, the way that we look at, the way that we even assess governments is, is uh, across several variables that are divided into, into five pillars. Or themes. Uh, one of those themes is strategic intent. Does the, the government have a, a digital inclusion strategy? Does that digital inclusion strategy reference people with disabilities, in particular, in different kinds of disabilities in particular? How is the leadership in the government involved and engaged in supporting increasing inclusion and accessibility? How is budget actually used? Is there money to support inclusion and, and accessibility? And importantly, as, as part of this strategic intent, does the government see a commitment to accessibility and inclusion beyond just legal compliance, which is important, uh, but really as, uh, uh, as benefiting the, the government, benefiting the city or the state or the university 
uh, beyond just legal compliance and risk avoidance and, and seeing it as a, a real business driver for a commitment to accessibility. And so we look at, at those sorts of things as we're working with, with governments. Um, another area that we, we think really defines a, an a inclusive smart government is culture. Does that government have a culture of innovation? Does it look at using technology in a very positive and proactive way um, to solve longstanding accessibility challenges? And does it involve people with disabilities as part of that innovation process? Does it have a culture of transparency? Uh, one of the keys uh, to smart cities uh, and really smart government is, is uh, as I mentioned, this open data, providing information out to the public. Um, but is that is that information, is that data accessible? I mentioned one example where it wasn't in, in that there's real impact, negative impact from it not being accessible. But a commitment to in, inclusion and accessibility as part of this culture of transparency of information is important. Um, a culture of community and, and citizen engagement, that back and forth communication with citizens and with people in the community, uh, not only pushing information out to them, critical information, but getting information from them that feeds into decision making and policy making. Is that process, that two way process, inclusive and accessible? A lot of times it's not, and, and we've seen in some of the, the governments that we've worked with around the world that there's real negative impact from that on people with disabilities. Uh, and, and a culture of diversity, and I think actually uh, Jenny and Microsoft is, are, are a great example of this. Uh, and we've seen it be a, a success factor with the, the universities and the, the, the cities and, and others that we've worked with, where a diverse workforce of the government, of the city, of the state, really helps to cement and solidify its commitment to inclusion and accessibility. And so uh, one of the things that as we're working with governments, we look at is, uh, is there this culture of diversity that brings people with disabilities into the workforce uh, and help transform that government into to having a stronger and, and uh, more impactful commitment to accessibility and inclusion. We also look at, at uh, as a sort of a third pillar of the way we, we define accessible and inclusive smart governments is ar around processes. The, how is the government structured? Is there someone that's actually responsible for these issues, a named manager or organizational unit? Uh, does the, the government use metrics for continuous improvement around inclusion and accessibility? Does the it, procurement is one of the processes of the government? Does it make sure that any investments it's making in technology, its assets, deployments, are those accessible? And how does it do that? Uh, partnerships. We've really seen partnerships, including public-private partnerships, as being critical to being both smarter and more inclusive. So, how does the government partner with universities, with civil society or NGOs and disability organizations? How does the government actually partner with with its technology vendors and the and, and, and those companies on being creative in approaches to inclusion and accessibility as they're using technology more and more for public services? So the the final two two pillars, the final two categories of how we define what a, an inclusive smart government is, are technology and data. And I, I like to say, and I've heard I think in other places that that technology is the backbone of a smart city or a smart government and data is the lifeblood. They're really critical to, to being smarter as organizations. So when we're talking about technology, when we're assessing governments, when we're working with them on roadmaps to improve, we're looking at things like, how does the government actually do an assessment of their own technology assets? Which of those assets are accessible? How does it remediate problems? Is there a process in place? Uh, if a problem with accessibility is brought to the government, how do they fix that? Is the government using uh, these global technology standards for accessibility and how are they using them? Uh, and with data, we're looking at um, things like the data divide, just like there's a digital divide, there's a data divide, which again, in smart governments, smart cities, smart states, uh, data is, is the lifeblood, it's critically important. Many governments are making both very mundane decisions uh, based on data uh, and also really critical decisions, including data that is generated by people in the community. Are people with disabilities represented in those data pools? Likely not. So we, we look at and work with the, the governments on making sure that their key data sets, their priority data sets, are inclusive of people with disabilities so that those policy decisions and those programmatic decisions really do reflect people with disabilities as well. Right now, they, they likely don't. Uh, so those are, are some of the key ways that, that we're looking at and working with governments on defining what it means to be 
both inclusive and smart at the same time uh, and really make that commitment that as we're becoming smarter, we're also becoming more inclusive and, and shrinking that digital divide. One of the processes that I mentioned that, that I just want to return to briefly because we've really seen it be uh, highly impactful and relatively easy for governments to do is in procurement. The public sector, particularly here in the U.S., is a huge consumer of technology. I think cities consume, uh, the, the federal government consumes uh, about 25% of all the technology purchased in the U.S. If you add in cities and states, it's over 40%. So states are enormous consumers of technology. They drive the market. So if you're requiring that your accessibility, that your technology that you're buying, that you're investing in, if you put that in your, in your RPs that it must be accessible, it really matters. Uh, it, it, it shows a commitment to inclusion as you're becoming smarter and leveraging technology. Um, and you end up deploying technology solutions that are actually accessible both to your employees, importantly, uh, if you're deploying those technologies internally, but also to the communities that you're serving if those technologies are supporting your services, your critical services. Uh, so it, when, I'm, when I'm asked for sort of what's a, an initial step that we absolutely must be doing as a government, one of the first ones I point to is making sure that every RFP that you put out uh, make, for, for a technology purchase references accessibility in these global accessibility standards. Uh, so Sierra, I think I'll, I'll leave it there and, and just uh, really appreciative of the work that you guys are doing around thinking about digital transformation as a, as a key to digital inclusion and an opportunity to promote it. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I really appreciate the point you made uh, where uh, digital connectivity, uh, we have to uh, promote the culture of which that can foster. So I'm really glad uh, that's the direction that uh, two of our speakers have taken so far today. We have one more. Our last but not least uh, speaker for the day is Karen Tamley, President and CEO of Access Living and ex-commissioner for the Chicago Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. Karen? Great, thank you, Sierra, so much for having me. Um, so as you mentioned, I became the new president and CEO of Access Living um, just this past March, and we are a Chicago-based nonprofit that <clears throat> provides advocacy and direct services to people with disabilities, um, people with all types of disabilities, with the goal of keeping our community um, independent as possible. Um, our advocacy and direct service work um, touches many different areas from healthcare and transportation to disability rights, immigration, education, housing, um, <clears throat> as well as youth empowerment and deinstitutionalization. So, as you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, um, prior to this, I served nearly 15 years as the commissioner for the mayor's office for people with disabilities for the city of Chicago, um, having been appointed by three different mayors, Mayor Daly, Mayor Emanuel, and um, most recently Mayor Lightfoot. And so um, that experience combined with my nonprofit experience, um, as well as my lived experience as a wheelchair user, um, has really enabled me to push forward uh, disability rights um, priorities, both in the government and the nonprofit sectors. So I am very excited to be on this panel with Jenny and James, um, who I have worked with um, a great deal in the past. So I think this topic is really important because working at the government level is probably one of the most important ways um, to effectuate change for people with disabilities, not just in terms of um, government funding, um, but also government programs, um, government policies, legislation, um, as well as guidance and executive orders that get put forth um, by state and local governments can, that can fundamentally change the lives of people with disabilities for the better. But it's also to, critical to think about the ways in which our governments are employers, are conduits of critical information and services, and the ways in which we're meeting the accessibility needs of our residents with disabilities. So based on my government experience, I wanna first briefly talk about some of the ways 
um, that I have been able to move or potentially other governments can move forward accessibility and inclusion for our community. First, I think it's important to understand, you know, why is this important? Is this issue important? It's important because we have to have an understanding of the numbers of people with disabilities that are out there. There's over 54 million people with disabilities in the United States. It's estimated that one in four have a disability. Our community is really diverse. There's a strong linkage as well between disability and poverty. And our community truly cuts across all racial ethnic lines. We're a community that um, is made up of people with multiple types of disabilities, physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, cognitive or intellectual disabilities, and so much more. And as was mentioned earlier, um, our disabilities are um, can be visible or invisible. And in fact, um, over 70% of people who have a disability have a non-apparent disability. We're also one of the fastest growing segments of the population and anyone can join our community through birth, through accident, illness, and much of our population is living longer with age-related disabilities. So it's really critical that we think about how we are making our governments accessible. And accessible, I mean, in the broadest sense of the word. How are we meeting one of the largest and growing, uh, fastest growing segments of our population? Um, the other thing that I think it's very important to keep in mind is that uh, the disability community has rights and disability rights are civil rights and governments in particular have um, a really unique and important obligation to comply with those rights um, that really touches so many aspects of government operations. So just a couple of ideas about moving your government forward in the area of accessibility and inclusion. First, I think one of the most important things is the leadership and the importance of leadership at the top to talk about disability rights, to talk about this being a priority um, from your mayor, from your governor, um, from your elected or appointed officials. And in Chicago, one of the most important acts that our mayor had taken back in 1990 was to create the mayor's office for people with disabilities. So the commissioner of that department, um, where I was previously, um, was in the mayor's cabinet. And being in the mayor's cabinet allowed disability issues to truly be elevated. It provided an authority to really move forward accessibility priorities, really at the highest level. Because I was peers with my other um, fellow commissioners. I was peers with the, um, you know, the police chief and the fire commissioner and the head of human services and the chief technology officers. And so that set a really important um, precedent and statement from, from our local government. Second, I think if you're gonna move forward disability or accessibility issues, you really have to think about accessibility in the broadest sense of the word. So we typically understand accessibility to be you know, ramps or elevators or restrooms or parking for people with physical disabilities, but we need to think really in the most broadest sense to think about programmatic accessibility, communication access, just to name a two. And accessibility will look different um, to different constituencies. So accessible government to me as a wheelchair user might be a very different view than it would be for someone who is blind or low vision or someone who is deaf and hard of hearing. It's also really important that our governments, that we understand what disability rights laws are and how they apply to your local government. So making sure that we understand not just the federal laws that are out there like the ADA, but looking at our state and local accessibility or disability laws that might be in place and how they apply to your local government. Um, and looking for opportunities to adapt standards and guidelines, um, particularly in the area of technology is one example. 
And then lastly, I think building relationships with the disability community and leaders in the disability community is really important. In my current CEO role, um, I have very strong relationships with our governor's office and key department heads that impact disability policy. And um, bringing that lived experience of those with disabilities to government policy decision-making is really, really important. So since we're on the topic of digital accessibility, I wanna to speak to that directly. Um, really what I learned and witnessed over time is that there is a transformation of our governments. When I first started at the city, we were very focused on making the physical aspects of our government accessible, our communication access accessible. Um, but really what I saw over time was that um, we moved from physical city hall to virtual city hall, where you could do business um, with your local government um, behind a computer screen. You can pay a parking ticket, you can get a permit, you can find out about a local festival, you can check out a library book or sign up for a city service, file a complaint, or even as James mentioned, check your daily COVID dashboard. Yet with this, unfortunately, people with disabilities have not equally had those same opportunities to access government services because the digital world is not kept up with accessibility. In the years I spent at municipal government, I saw this really firsthand, the challenges the people with disabilities face. And I still see this now in my role at Access Living. First, I think what I saw is that our community is disproportionately poor, which has resulted in our community being less connected, less able to afford a smartphone or a device or a computer. And I was really shocked by the number of people that we served at the city that didn't even have an email address. In Chicago, our data shows that 35% of people with disabilities live below the poverty line. Many in our most underserved communities um, weren't even connected. And so that was an issue and it still is an issue that um, our residents face regardless of disability and um, that we see as more of an issue of being low income versus disability. But again, we know that there's such a strong crossover between disability and poverty that this certainly affected our community. Um, what I saw also at the city was that too few people with disabilities had the digital literacy skills or the comfort level, level needed to complete an application for government services. And over a, probably a four month period, um, we tallied over 2000 people that came to us for assistance um, with signing up for critical benefits because those had gravitated to an online application and people didn't have the comfort level to be able to complete those applications. And then on top of this, we know that our websites were not reliably accessible because there hadn't been a recognized priority um, and no real gatekeeping methods put into place by our governments, whether it's state, county, or even local to uniformly address the accessibility issues. Um, I think James even, again, mentioning the COVID dashboard as being something that's very timely, things that people need this critical information and access to that isn't currently available to people with disabilities. So some of the ways that we tackled the digital disparity for people with disabilities or you as a government can think about tackling this are first and foremost, including disability and accessibility into your government's digital agenda. Whether um, So make that a priority. Make it a priority around connectivity, around accessibility, around access to devices. Um, accessibility was a part of our digital action agenda in Chicago, and we had accessibility and disabilities part of our data strategy as well. It's important that you educate yourselves about um, what accessibility means in the digital space. And I often don't take this for granted that there is a universal understanding of what that means. I think we know what accessibility means for people with physical disabilities in the form of ramps and elevators, but do we really know what an accessible website means or how to make your forms and application for services accessible 
or how a blind person might use your payment or information kiosks. So really level setting around the education of what accessibility means is a really important place to start. Um, the other things that we did was looking at adopting a set of accessibility standards to what your government um, should be following. So in Chicago, we use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines as our baseline citywide standard. And this was the standard that we used in the development of technology deployments like our 311 um, mobile app or when we purchased um, any type of information technology. So you can adopt this by ordinance, executive order, or just simply a directive from your leadership. Um, I think it's really important to also look at your hiring practices. Do you have people with disabilities working at all levels of your government? What does your cabinet look like? Does your diversity policies include people with disabilities? Um, this sends a really important signal, not just about your, your priorities, but it can also help you build internal competencies around accessibility and disability inclusion. And then from there, you can look at your internal policies, like a reasonable accommodation policy for your employees. What does that look like? How do you communicate it um, widespread across your government? Um, I mentioned using procurement as the way to ensure that you can gatekeep information policies. So I think that's really important not just to maintain compliance, but to ensure that you're sending that signal to any vendor who wants to do business with your city, your, your state, your government, that if you're gonna do business with us, you have to have a product um, that's going to be accessible. And because governments have large um, buying power, they also have the ability to impact the landscape of products that are out there. So one of the other ways that we as a city in Chicago um, were able to really look at improving our competencies around digital inclusion um, was what James mentioned, was the maturity model. And Chicago was fortunate to be one of the first cities to pilot um, G3ICT's accessibility maturity model. And it really looked at a lot of different ways in which um, you know, we were or were not mature around digital inclusion. So whether, whether that was technology or data, um, our culture, our vision, um, that was a really great tool for us to take an internal look about how we were doing and to set some goals and benchmarks for ourselves as government. So really what I'm seeing now during this pandemic, um, just to wrap up here is that you know, people with disabilities, I think, are feeling more and more isolated. Um, I think the, the move to working remote, the increased reliance on um, digital and technology has really just exposed the disparities that people with disabilities already came with before this pandemic. Um, what we're seeing is that there were a lot of people with disabilities in Chicago that didn't even have laptops um, for as we moved to digital learning in our schools. Um, we still have many people that aren't connected or don't um, have a device or a laptop or a smartphone. And so that has been a really important priority as we've been able to access our community relief funds. We've used that to help people with disabilities purchase technology that they need to stay connected. Um, and so I would just close by saying, you know, while this pandemic has exposed a lot of disparities, whether on the disability front, um, but also on race and income, um, it also presents an opportunity and a challenge for us to move the needle on um, digital accessibility and inclusion um, moving forward so that all of us can equally participate. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I think we can all appreciate one of Access Living's philosophies, uh, nothing about us without us. And I'm glad you brought up the need to have the people affected by these policies and technologies included in the conversations about them. So unfortunately, it does look like our time is up. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. And I know a few of us have some hard stops at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern. 
Um, we do have questions from subcommittee members, and I will be in contact with each of you on the best way we can get those answered. Uh, so with that, I want to sincerely thank again each of our speakers, Jenny Leigh Fleury, Karen Tamley, and James Thurston. Thank you all so much for joining us and sharing your experiences and your expertise on this subject. I'm so glad the position we've taken is not just about technology because although it is so important in creating this future of inclusivity, but it's also about creating and fostering a mindset that is open and able to accommodate every person and connect every person to government services because that's really the other half of the battle. So very quickly, I'd also like to thank uh, Belinda Bradley for being an amazing ASL interpreter. I've had my video on so I can watch and hopefully pick up some things myself. Uh, so thank you for your service, Belinda, and for promoting accessibility as well. So if there are no further comments, I think we can end it here and call it a successful day. Thank you all so much.